Hi, I'm Dr. John Villard, and welcome to LifeSpa.com, where we prove ancient medical wisdom with modern science. In today's podcast, I'm super excited to have our guest who's written a bunch of books, and most recently her book called Microbia, which is a book all about the microbiome. And there are many, many books out there about the microbiome, many of which um, can be very dense and very hard to assimilate. And uh, Eugenia Bone, who is my guest here today, went back to school to actually study microbiology and has written an incredible book that I just have fell in love with. She's written a bunch of other books. Let me tell you a little about who she is and then we'll kind of dive in and, and we'll talk to her. Eugenia Bone is a critically acclaimed journalist with an emphasis on nature and food and former president of the New York, New York Micro, uh, Mycological Society. She's a member of the National Association of Science Writers. Her previous books include Microphilia, The Kitchen Ecosystem, A, uh, a, a Mesa's Edge, Italian Family Dining, and Well Preserved. And the subtitle of Well Preserved is Recipes and Techniques for Putting Up Small Batches of Seasonal Food. So Eugenia is really all about what we do here at LifeSpa, which is to help people understand the value and the benefit of seasonal eating. So we're going to talk about some of the, the microbiological aspects of that and how important that is, you know, and, and get into some detail of that. I'm really excited because she speaks our language, which is going to be great. Her books have been nominated for a variety of awards. She's a great writer, including the Colorado Book Award, the James Beard Award, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Food and Wine, Gourmet, among others. She's, you know, a really amazing author. We're super happy to have her here. Eugenia, Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> we're talking about seasonal eating. Um, and um, there has been studies that show that hunter-gatherers would, uh, it was a Stanford study that came out about six months ago, that their gut bugs changed dramatically from one season to the next to the next. There was a book out, you may remember it, called The Forest Unseen, mm -hmm. where this guy botanist took a square meter of earth and watched it every day. Yeah. Remember that book? Yes, I do. And in that book, he talks about a study where they took deer, and deer ate bark in the winter, and they had leaves in the summer. And they have different bugs for bark in the winter and different microbes for digesting leaves in the summer. Mm -hmm. And if they gave the deer the bark in the summer when they had the wrong bugs, right. it could cause such a level of indigestion, it could kill the deer. Yeah. That blew my mind. You know, like you've had many mind-blowing experiences when you oh, went yeah. back to school. Yeah. So that really blew my mind. I wrote a book called The Three Season Diet about eating yeah. seasoning that nobody really read. So I was like, okay, this is too important. So we're, we took all the recipes and the grocery list and superfoods and made them into monthly packets that people could get and learn how to eat with the seasons. And the value of that is that, and my question to you is that we know that the, the bugs change in the ground from one season to the next, and those bugs attach to the foods, and those foods become our, our new microbiome. Tell me what you know about <clears throat> that part of it, the, the soil part, you know, the, the changing of the garden in this, in, in, from season to season, and how these, how these bugs work in the soils, and how they get into the plant, how all that works. Yeah. All right, so soil science is <clears throat> way complicated. And I only touch on it in Microbia in a couple of chapters, try to give an overview. But basically what goes down is in a, in a healthy soil environment, you'll, there'll be a lot of diversity of microbes, lots of different species. And what the plant does is it recruits the microbes it needs to deal with various stresses and nutritional needs. So, it's not so much like the microbial populations um, uh, don't exist or exist, but rather they, the, the populations increase or decrease. It's really a true ecology. So what the plant does is the plants actually spend up to 40% of their sugars that they make as a result of photosynthesis to attract the microbes they need in order to live the best life they can to deal with environmental stresses like drought, to deal with um, insect pests and things like that. If there's not a diversity of microbes for them to uh, recruit, and they recruit with this 
this, um, these sugars that they seep out of their roots. It's kind of like root sweat. And it goes out in the soil and the bacteria, depending on specific elements or qualities in that root sweat, it's called exudites, the bacteria come, they get recruited. Um, so if there's a diversity in the soil and in a natural environment where the soil has been present a long time and the ecology is diversi diversified into more and more species present, then the plant has lots of options to survive the day. The same thing is actually true of us. If you've got a diversity of microbes in your gut, you have a greater opportunity to, um, to get nutrition from a variety of sources. Uh, the truth of the matter is we don't have a lot of variety of species in our gut, certainly not like someone, uh, who, a hunter-gatherer, or our ancestors, where they were eating all of these different foods and picking up all of these different microbes. They were ultimately recruiting microbes to help digest, digest the food they were eating, and they were recruiting them by eating that food in the first place. You see, so it's not like um, the microbes uh, determine the diet, but rather the diet determines the microbes. What you eat is what feeds the microbial populations in your gut. What the plant recruits um, with these yummy exudites, these yummy secretions, is what increases those microbial populations um, in the soil. And when you have a low diversity of microbes in the soil, there's less um, mercenaries, there's less allies that the plant can recruit um, in order to uh, not only combat stresses, but just to, uh, um, to get increased uh, micronutrients. So all you've got, when you have a lot of microbes in the soil, there's a lot of opportunities to get more micronutrients like iron and you know these little things that you need that the plants don't make. So you're saying that the, that the plants, which I, I never thought of that, that way, the plants are actually driving the microbial species. The plants are recruiting the species. And attracting them. They're attracting them. So the, there'll be more of the, the and the, what they feed is what succeeds. Right. So the plants are attracting microbes that are in the soil. If there's a diversity, right. then they, the plants have more options of who to recruit. But if there's not a diversity in soil, then they're less able to do that. And regarding mm -hmm. the idea of whether mo uh, microbial populations, there's some more in some seasons than others, um, I don't know, right. honestly, about, I think that, you know, you have to remember that each place is unique. But think about you know? it this way, so, dandelion, right, goes yeah. in your garden in the, sp in the spring. Yeah. So that dandelion is going to shoot roots out and it's going to produce its exudate, mm -hmm. its right. sugary exudate, and it's going to attract a certain kind of microbe that it needs. Exactly. And that dandelion only does grow in the spring. Yeah. So that demand for dandelion loving bugs is going to, you know, surge in the spring. Yeah, and it's right? going to search for those, for those organisms. Guys. But if they're not there, the dandelions will fail to thrive. And that and because the dandelion is putting out dandelion beneficial bugs the and is it, feeding them in a big way, right. you're going to have those bugs multiplying in greater right. percentage so you're going right. to get more of those bugs. Right. There you go. So there you go. It's like an ecology. Right. It's a it's two kingdoms connected in an ecology. Yeah. Wow. I know it's a little bit and here just to make things even kind of more complicated. Yeah. Um so I saw that I was uh, talking to a scientist at Rutgers, Jim White, wonderful scientist, and he uh, had taken some pictures of um, soil bacteria that were migrating from the soil into the cells, the root cells of plants. So the cell, the root, the plant was you know, doing some kind of magic where their their cell walls were degrading enough for the bacteria to come in. The bacteria enter the cell they do something and then they go out again. They're still living. So the, the um, drop off their load and leave. What's yeah, the it's drop off their load or, or yeah, provide some kind of service or maybe it's totally 
in the bacteria's interest, but whatever it is, the, the, the border between what is a plant and what is soil is open. That's an open border. So we draw lines around nature, say, okay, this is a plant and this is soil, but actually nature doesn't draw on the lines. You know, nature doesn't color in the lines because the two are constantly interacting. Are constantly, it's an open border. Yeah. Wow. Which goes back to what you talked about in the beginning of the book, how, how bacteria are really the link between the living and the non-living. Yeah. Right? So yeah, talk to they me, make food. Talk to me about that. Okay, so I love, <clears throat> this is such a cool thing. Yeah. And, all right, so um, bacteria and archaea, which is like bacteria, they're both prokaryotes, so they're single-celled organisms, smallest unit of life. They've just got a little tangle of DNA inside no them. Nucleus, nothing, no nucleus, nothing. No nucleus, not a whole lot going just on. Just DNA, basically. DNA and a few little working parts, okay. you know. Um, and what what they do, what some kinds do, do is they, um, they capture the nutrients of life, carbon, nitrogen, um, uh, hydrogen, from the, either from the atmosphere, from gas form, or from minerals. And they terrestrialize those nutrients, thereby making them available to other organisms. When the bacteria um, captures those nutrients from an inorganic state, from a non-living state, when they capture them into their own bodies, they use, the, they use those nutrients in order to increase, to grow. Right. They terrestrialize those nutrients and make them available to, any ever, to every other critter that comes along. Bacteria bridge the non-living and living worlds by, um, by capturing inorganic nutrients and making them organic. Organic in their cell. They are the base of the food chain. But then how That's do they go from the, their cell to the other cells? How does it take that next step for me? So then something comes along and eats them. Eats the cell. Eats the cell. Eats the bacteria. And then something comes along and eats that. And then we go up to the food chain, up to the scale of us. Now this genetic material in those bacteria is being sort of horizontally transferred into the genetic yeah. material of whoever ate it, right? Um, you know, genetic transfer between right. bacteria, between prokaryotes, okay. bar bacteria and archaea <clears throat> is an incredibly cool thing. Okay. They don't, you know, when we pass along genetic material, we do it with our, through sex, but when, they have, when we have children, and then we have to wait a generation to see what shakes down, and then another generation to see what sh takes shakes down. Takes a while. But with bacteria and archaea, for that matter, they share genes by touching, right. ultimately. So they have, horizontal, uh, a gene, uh, they have horizontal transfer of genes. So let's say you're a bacteria, and let's do an analogy. If you are, and you're a bacteria, but let's say you are um, going to go and live in Switzerland, but you're lactose intolerant. You don't right. have the gene to break down lactose, to be able to eat cheese. Um, and milk and stuff. So that's going to be a problem in Switzerland. Right. Um, but big if you, problem. big problem, right? You're going to be pretty hungry. But if you meet someone who um, does have, like a Swiss guy, who does have the gene for breaking down lactose, and you shake hands. Shake hands again. I say thank you very much for the lactose bring tolerance. On the, bring on the dairy. I got the gene, and I can immediately, right? Immediately within that lifestyle, with that lifespan of that bacteria. I can, use the, I can use the gene and survive the day. And there's more. Let's say, so that would be from one species of back, for, for two different bacteria, same species, right? They can share lateral gene transmission that right. way. But then, let's say you, um, <clears throat> you meet a lactose tolerant Swiss dog and you shake paws with the dog. You could still get the gene. That's because in the case of bacteria, you don't have to be the same species. They can share genes between species. And there's more. There's well, one more. No, keep it going. This there's is another. Great. Let's say the lactose tolerant uh, Swiss guy that you met sat on a chair, spontaneously combusts, and then you sit on the chair. You could still pick up the lactose tolerant from gene that. just from genes that are loose I and remaining. I about that. Like when you kill a squirrel or whatever, they die, that they're 
bacteria go into the soil and they change the microbiology of the soil for a period of time. And I think, I could be wrong on this, but I think it was sort of like created sort of like, I don't know, some, I can't maybe, I, I think it was sort of like fear-based emotion in that soil and then the, the bugs there were sort of altered by the fear of whatever of dying. I'm not sure about that, but there are studies show that their bugs go into that soil. And, but anyway, I also want to talk about um, how in, in humans there's a thing called horizontal transfer of genes, right? We eat a microbe, a, you know, eat a vegetable that has a mutated bug on it. The DNA from that is going to horizontally transfer into our right. genetic code and right. let us know there's some weird stuff out there. Yeah. You guys better get ready. Yeah. Is that how it works? It, well, so it's not common. Like okay. the way we do it with sex, it's actually been very successful, as you can tell, because we're a pretty successful species. Right. But, um, it, but we do have, there is evidence of horizontal gene transmission. And, and here's the example that, like all the scientists like to cite. Yeah. So there's a population in Japan. And when, you know, we're, it, our species, we are carnivores. We can't digest plants by and large. We don't have, we don't have the genes to produce the enzymes to break down plants. Our microbiome, the bugs that live in our guts, they break down plants for us. There are symbionts. There are sort of secondary digestion, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, but in Japan, there is a population that can digest with their own genes seaweed. Well, it turns out that they were eating this seaweed, which is covered with a microbe that's capable of breaking right. down the seaweed. And over time, the gene that allows that microbe to break down the, the, the seaweed joined or was incorporated into that Japanese population's genome. And now that population is able to get nutrition from seaweed without the help of the microbe. How long did that take? I don't know. Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. I imagine, you know, not that long because how long have you know, people been living in Japan? So, you know. I don't know. Whatever, 50,000 years? Yeah, 10,000 years, not that long. Yeah. I mean, right. not that long when you look at Well, we're trying nature. to get a gene for something. I have to wait. I like to wait less than 50,000. Well, you can just splice one in, too. Oh, no, I, you can do CRISPR, CRISPR right? yeah. and, uh, there, yeah. you know, I mean, that's what genetically modified organisms are. are. Yeah. It's just putting in a gene that can do that job, do a particular job that you have, you know, identified needs to be done. So what do you think of that, the GMOs, putting them in? What's your um, you know, my feeling about GMOs is, is, is complicated because I'm not really, like, against the idea of GMOs in general. Um, I think that um, what is definitely clear is that when you start, like the main use of GM GMOs right now seems to be um, uh, the insertion into plants and ability to tolerate certain herbicides, right? right? <clears throat> it's not so much the genetic modification of the plant that has a lot of people worried so much as when you screw around with the ecology by putting, by killing all of these other plants, yeah. all those plants have relationship with, relationships with microbes in the soil, which right. actually maintain diversity. So there's cascading effects ecologically. Right. We have and no idea about that. Yeah, it's well, like when you go. It's and, very hard to get science off of that. When you kill the that. wolves or take the wolves out, that whole story you tell. Exactly. Right. And that, to me, can you share that? Yeah, that yeah. that's the analogy that like broke open the whole microbiome <clears throat> mystery for me, which yeah. was, you know, it's daunting material. <laughs> when you look look at microbiology, oh my God, it's it's so complicated. It was it's so um, there's so many working parts and there's so much that's unknown. So for people like me <clears throat> who don't have a lot of science background, I found it was most useful to find analogies and big concepts that would help me understand the way microbial life lives. And the thing that helped me the most was to recognize that, my, that microbial life, invisible life, microscopic organism, organisms live by the same rules of ecology as anything else. You know, the, the rules of ecology are so consistent sense, right? from, the minis, from the microscopic to the macroscopic. Right. So, um, when a, it's a really famous class that they give you in biology, you know, if you go back to college, a bunch of kids like I did, um, and that is the story of the wolves of Yellowstone Park. So, the wolves in Yellowstone Park were tormenting the um, 
uh, local rancher sheep. And so the ranchers put pressure on the parks department and said, get rid of the wolves. They did. Wolves got taken out of the ecosystem and the elk populations expanded. They went crazy. They started um, hanging around on the stream banks and eroding the stream banks, uh, eating all the willows. Without a lot of willows, the beavers didn't have the material, <clears throat> excuse me, the material they need to build their dams. Without beaver dams, there was no little ponds, so the ducks didn't come, and you know, it was cascading effects. Yeah. Then at some point, someone had the bright idea of putting the wolves back into the eco ecosystem. And then the ecology rebalanced itself. The elk got on the hoof. They didn't graze too much on the streams. Um, the beaver came back, the ducks came back, and so on. So the same thing is true in your body and in my body. There's no such thing as bad bacteria and good bacteria. Right. There's only the wrong population numbers for the ecosystem, which is you. Right or could be you or could be any other place, soil, a right. plant, just the wrong population numbers. The ratio of populations is what equals ecological health. And if you're the ecology, then you can say the population ratios of microbes in and on your body is what determines your health too. Hmm. I know, it's so lovely that there's yeah. these consistent <clears throat> concepts because Science is so complicated to so understand. There, so there was one study that I read that I wrote about a while back that showed that I think it was in the last 30 years we have 56 percent that globally we eat 56 percent less diverse foods. Yeah. So the global diet is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, yeah. creating the same sort of industrial foods globally. Yeah. And I'm in not add that to processed foods and sprayed foods that have no bugs on them because they've been killed. Yeah. Um, has a lot to do with a lack of diversity in our gut. Yeah, right? exactly. Or right. baby, think of it, so you start out engineering a baby's ecosystem, uh, we give them sterile baby food. Yeah. There's no microbes there, yeah. so who's gonna do the job of breaking down their vegetables? And when you have these um, inadequate microbiota living, say, in your colon, um, then there's cascading effects that ultimately can lead to these constant inflammatory um, states that people suffer from more and more um, uh, in this century, post World War II, it seems. Right. So in your gut, I mean, there's no, there's, I know there's no good guys and bad guys at all, but there are, you know, bugs that are sort of for your particular gut that are doing not so good things, and there's bugs that are doing good things, and there's also bugs in there that are doing nothing, that are spectators, right? That take up a lot of the real estate, right? You, you, and and what I find is that that um, well, everybody's taking probiotics these days to ans amp up their ability to boost the good guys, right? And I've never been a fan of probiotics for years because when I got into practice in 1984, we give digestive enzymes, we give probiotics, and they would get better. And then as soon as you take them off of them, right. they would get worse again. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, this doesn't feel good to me. I can't give people stuff that they're going to have to take for the rest of their life yeah. to feel good. And who knows if the body will adapt and you know, get used to it and it will stop working. So I always told my, my suppliers for the years, I said, you find me a micro probiotic that can stick and adhere to the gut wall uh, and create permanent resonance called colonizing probiotics. Yeah. I'm gonna be on board with that. Yeah. So there are some ones like uh, Bifidobacterial lactis mm -hmm. HN019 mm -hmm. is one that has been proven to stick to the gut wall right. and increase proliferation of more diversity by like 40 to 60%. Yeah. I didn't believe the study. So I took about 20 patients of mine and we gave half the group that probiotic and half the group didn't. Yeah. And they all went to Europe, about yeah. 20 people, and we took their, micro, their, their, their samples before and after. And when they came back, the group that took the probiotic literally had about 40% more. Yeah. So what I do from the Ayurvedic perspective is I try to do a whole series of steps to, to lay down soluble fiber, to knock out the spectator microbes that aren't doing anything good, and then to give a temporary dosage of colonizing probiotics to restore the function while we're rebooting upper digestion to get them to break the food down properly so we're not letting undigested food go down and rip the guts to shreds and, and not detox properly to kind of create, which I think caused the damage of the gut bugs in the first place in addition to the lack of diverse foods and the pesticides laden foods and, and yeah, all of right. that. So, so I, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, that's my take on probiotics. I'm curious about what your take on probiotics is. So probiotics means uh, living microbes, yeah. right? Living bacteria. 
and although they could also be fungi like Saccharomyces. Right. Um, the thing is, is most of the probiotics that are on the market and so on, um, what they um, what they are is they're providing transient microbes, which you need. You have permanent residents, as you were saying, and then right. you have transients, which are part of the ecology. You transient microbes, they're like it's just like a right outside um, this house there's a bunch of trees you've got some birds that are there all year round and then you got some birds that just come through in the summer and but they are those transients are part of the ecology they play a role in interacting with insects and pollination or right. whatever it is right so the same thing is true in us we've got our permanent residents which are these fiber fermenters that are living on the um, the mucus layer uh, above our colon wall and then we've got all of these transients that are coming through. And they're very important because they sort of poop out these mo molecules that our cells need to, um, to compose or to, to build important compounds like neurotransmitters and vitamins and, and, um, and hormones like serotonin. So if you're gonna, the, the, you can't, one can't think of probiotics of, these, uh, of taking a transient microbe as anything but a constant right. effort because right. a bacteria like lactobacillus which we benefit greatly from is a transient you just got to eat it all the time because right. you're, you're taking it in and it's going out the other end yeah. so what I always like my takeaway from studying this stuff is I just make um, homemade yogurt and sauerkraut um, and I don't eat it every day but I basically fold it into my diet and I just eat those transient microbes on a regular basis and you know and they when they pass through and they interact with the cells of my of my colon and with the other bacteria they do their chores and then they come out the other end mm -hmm. but it's really like there's two cycles going on mm -hmm. right one is semi-permanent and the other is permanent and mm -hmm. that permanent one is important because it's um, it's kind of engineered um, early in life um, you know, it's, uh, we, we develop our, our gut microbiome anyway in successive waves, just like right. uh, in nature, you know, like you can't um, germinate a coconut on a bare lava uh, island. You need the soil builders in there first and set up the stay, and then the coconut can germinate. Mm. So the same thing goes with us. If we don't have that first pioneer species when we're babies, which we get from uh, passage through the vaginal canal and through breastfeeding, um, then uh, uh, some of those kids, you know, those adults, when they grow up, they don't, don't necessarily have a gut that's set up so well. You mentioned, I think, that, that um, kids who grew up from C-sections have a higher risk of asthma, was it? Uh-huh, right? and allergies, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, they do. Um, and that's... How about breastfeeding? Is there any, any... Yeah, so breastfeeding is a probiotic and a prebiotic. You know, pre so what if you weren't breastfed? If you aren't breastfed, then screwed? you don't benefit from, well, you know, like we're surviving. So it's, you know, I think the way the, it, it, we tend to, to always think about us individually, but the way nature, at least the nature that I'm writing about, functions is on an evolutionary scale, right? right. So if we stopped breastfeeding as a species, right. That would be bad, right. but uh, you know, if some people are and they're going to deal with some physical problems, maybe as a result. I mean, it's not guaranteed that they will, but right. it's optimum to be born vaginally, so you pick up all those yummy microbes on your way through the right. birth canal. Because um, if you're born C-section, a lot of those microbes you pick up are harmless skin bacteria, but those right. aren't your ideal pioneer species. Yeah. That's not necessarily how you want to set up. Although, there was this incredibly cool and strange little paper that came out and said if mom goes into labor before and, and has to have a, but has to have a C-section, the babies still pick up those vaginal microbes. Nobody knows. They're like, wow. Oh, wow. wow. So when you're in labor and you're in business, <clears throat> so somehow they transfer right away. If you right let away. yourself go into labor before the C-section, I mean, not every woman has that option. But yeah. if you do, I mean, it's, not a, it's better. And then there's also swabbing. More and more moms are, are having their vaginal microbes um, uh, collected and then swabbed all over the, C the baby that's had a C-section, which does seem to restore partial 
That's uh, right. microbiota. She also mentioned a book I thought was really interesting, like, you know, using like, obviously, most people know antibacterial soaps are really a bad idea. But what I didn't, what you said, I thought was one of those like, wow, that when you take an antibiotic or you're taking um, antibacterial soap and then you get a cut, you tell me yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> so the thing about antibiotics that a lot of, and um, alcohol can be, you know, there's al things like Purell, that alcohol stuff yeah. is pretty much the same sort of thing. Um, in that it kills a lot of organisms that are on your hands. So the way antibiotics work that people often don't seem to appreciate is that it's not like the antibiotic targets a specific bug. What it does is it's, it targets the qualities of types of bacteria. So an analogy would be you want to get rid of the sharks in the bay. So you create a toxin that kills um, fish with cartilage works, gets rid of the sharks, but it also kills all the rays. So that's mm -hmm. how antibiotics work. You get all of this collateral damage. So when you use an antibiotic wipe on your hands, you are, you're killing that single little plague bacterium that might be there, but you're also killing all of these bacteria that do jobs on your skin. Protection? protection and the way they do it is so cool they do it and this is an ecological rule they fill all the niches life will always fill a habitat I love that isn't I, that cool I love that yeah every habitat is full of life right. and um, so one of the ways that bacteria um, and other microorganisms uh, protect not only your colon wall but also your skin is by filling all the niches so there's no room for an, um, a pathogen to get a foothold, right? There's just nowhere right. for them to move right. in. Right. All the apartments are filled. Everything's, every space is rented. And they, these organisms really kind of pay their rent right. on you by, doing, by being like a prophylactic. Yeah. They provide this prophylactic layer. But when you wipe them out and, they, and you do get cut, um, or you do have an, 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 a vulnerability to the pathogens, right. which are everywhere as well, right. then you could actually develop an infection. So mm -hmm. Same thing inside your gut too, right? Same thing. in your respiratory tract, totally same, same thing. Exactly same yeah. thing. So, I mean, the principle, it seems to me like <laughs> it can be really hard to learn the specifics of microbiology, but you can learn the principles and then you just apply well, them yeah, right. to any yeah. ecosystem. That's what I love this about. This one, this it, one. This is by Ayurveda, which is, you know, is the science of life. It's a study of the logic of nature and it applies, you know, microscopically and macroscopically, which is so similar to what, why it's, it's what you're talking about, which is so cool. I want to change the subject. Um, my daughter came back from Africa. She's 15. She, my, my oldest daughter runs a foundation there and she came back cool. and my daughter went with her and she fell sort of in love with this. She's in 15. She fell in love with this college kid who was there. And she came back and she said, um, and I said, I'm telling you, like, she goes, do you think he knows that I like him? I'm going like, absolutely he knows that you like him. She goes, well, how? I never said anything. I say, he can feel it. He can smell it on your skin. Like you're putting out pheromones. I'm telling you that there's science behind the fact that he can feel it just like you can feel yeah. it, right? Yeah. So you write about how, how these bugs are really in charge of that, right? Well, they certainly, I mean, all right. So the studies okay. are kind of all over and all you right. can extrapolate probably pretty safely. Yeah. But um, the, the kind of studies, well, so bacteria on our skin have a lot to do with the way we, different smells right. that are produced. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, there was a study done that, su that showed that um, women sniffing the armpits of two groups of men were more turned off by the body odor of men who actually had syphilis than men who didn't. That was the compared groups, men without syphilis, men with syphilis. And the women they didn't, like, didn't the like the BO of the guy with the syphilis. BO, body odor, produced on your armpits, that's produced by bacteria that right. are living in your little sweat pores and they're, yeah. they're living there eating some of the compounds in your sweat and they're sort of pooping out. You know, they're, they're, they're leaving behind these sulfurous How smelling cool molecules. How cool is that, right? I mean, that's amazing. So we have this deep, layer yeah. of communication by means of bacterial scents right. um, that I think have evolutionary 
benefits and right. evolutionary purpose, if right. you want to say, put it that way. But what about attraction, physical attraction on the other side of that coin? Instead of repelling, or is, is, there, or is there any science on the attraction side? Um, because you talk about did like I the, talk about it? I'm trying you, to remember what I did. You talk about sex, I, like that. There's that they're in charge of. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's like very. Um, so that's on a really basic level because okay. the um, that's the you mean the Red Queen hypothesis? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Definitely. okay. Red Queen hypothesis. This is a book that was written in the 70s, I think. Um, maybe the 80s. Anyway, it's quite brilliant. And the hypothesis, what it suggests is um, that the reason why we, our species and an animals in general, evolved to have sex was in order to um, increase the possibility of our genes mixing up and coming, and, and coming up with progeny that might be better able to fight off um, pathogenic microbes. So here's, it's sort of, here's the deal. It's like, um, well, let me first say what the Red Queen hypothesis, why it's yeah. called that. So in Alice in Wonderland, Oops. Um, Alice and the Red Queen are running. They're in a race, right? But they're not going anywhere. They're just running. And Alice says, you know, what a strange country you live in. Where, where I come from, when you run really fast, you get somewhere. And the Red Queen said, well, what a strange country you live in. Because here you have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. So the Red Queen hypothesis says that we have sex in order to, um, to produce new mutations in our children, new genetic combinations that will allow our child and our grandchildren to out-evolve the pathogens that attack us that are doing the same thing. It's a kind of arms race between but humans and... But the bugs are and, multiplying like every 10 to 20 minutes. Yeah. And we're multiplying every 10 to 20 years. Yeah, but their ability to... Hard to figure out how to beat that. We can't beat them. Right, but there's not that many that are our pathogens. Okay. I mean, if you think about it, um, if all bacteria were bad for us, we'd all be dead yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they're everywhere. Right. And most of them are um, really not that interested in us at all. And some of them, you know, and many of them are, are key to our health. But people get fixated, I think, on the germ theory and for good reason. I mean, that's how we came to learn and understand about microbes in the first place, is right. when we learned that microorganisms cause disease. And so now people think bugs or microorganisms equals disease. But of course, we ha maintain that myopic view to our own despair. So they were here first, right? Oh yeah. And First organisms. somehow we evolved as a result of them. Oh, yeah. And somehow, would it be safe to say that we are here in support of them? Or are they in support of us? No, are we, did we create this tube of our digestive system so they had a, a bigger, happier place to stay? Oh, and then, yeah. And then we yeah. started moving around so we could get more awareness of the environment yeah. and do exactly what you said, share genes, multiply, yeah. do all that, just to, so, so these bugs can, can keep up one, one step ahead of the guys over in the next county yeah. doing yeah. their bug thing that could somehow take them out? Well, it can seem like intent is at work, but natural selection really isn't heading toward anything. There's no direction to natural selection. It's more like whatever the environment is, whoever can survive the environment that day, right. that's the critter that, that makes it. And so really it's symbiosis that describes um, our state of being with microbes. We've come to an agreement of sorts. Um, we help each other survive the day. Why are we here? Well, for me, you should for, talk to, I don't know, a priest I know, this about is that. crazy, but, but I don't know. Like, to me, it's just like, I mean, if that's, they started with bugs and we're here today, are we here for the bugs? And that we evolved to somehow keep them happy and they're really running the show. They got a heck of a lot more DNA going than we do. And Yeah, that's, that's You know, joke. so it's like, they're, I don't know. Is, but is they that, are us. We are them. They, yeah. we are in essence microbial. I mean, yeah. the little organelle in your cell, your mitochondrion, is the descendant of an ancient rock bacteria. In fact, it's the descendant of the same kind of bacteria that causes Rocky Mountain 
uh, spotted fever. It's still around. And yeah. that little mitochondrion in that, w you know, that takes the oxygen you breathe and the, the food you eat and to make energy that makes you go, that's essential to you, like, going yeah. <laughs> every day, getting yeah. up every day, yeah. is the descendant of a bacterium. So we've never not been microbial. Right. Right. And we didn't evolve away from microbes. This is another misconception that, that I had. I always thought, you know, microbes, little, you know, fishes and yeah. little people, you know, that evolution was somehow a direction, but it's not. It's really like, my, you know, life started with these bacteria-like organisms and then life just added on, <laughs> right. you know? So it's much more of a... I know, like a Russian nesting doll model, yeah. rather than sort of these linear projections you see, you used to see in eighth grade uh, sure. science books. You know. Yeah. So talk to me about the um, the cloud of microbes that we carry around. Is that our aura? I mean, what is that? I, I know I can go. I can go there. All right, I can okay. go there. I mean, just for fun. I know that we're leaving the world of science for a minute. Not but. that much, <clears throat> because this, this, there are studies on yeah. microbial clouds. So we are, you and I right now, and your listeners in their homes, are all shedding microbes all the time. You know, not vast amounts of them. I suppose it depends on how like, much you wash and so on. So but, if I went like that and like that, I definitely put your microbes on my skin? Well, think about it. Yeah. Every time we shake hands, we're sharing. We're, okay. We're doing a transmission of transient microbes, microbes right. that don't stay. Right. Right. And one of the things, by the way, I just have to point out is that even if in that handshake, let's say I have a little plague bacterium on my hand. Oh, thank you very much. It's not a problem. Yeah. One ba bacterium can't do very much except look for food. That's yeah. about all they're programmed to do. Okay. But if they find the food yeah. and the particular habitat, the pH and all that stuff that it needs, then they can reproduce. If they reproduce in large enough numbers, then they are able to turn on all kinds of genes and present virulence and do all sorts of cool and uncool things, depending on your point of view. So, the, um, so those microbes that we are shedding right now mm -hmm. are mostly harmless skin bacteria. And we're the same species, so we have a baseline similar um, uh, um, uh, population um, character. You know, we have the right. same types, the same types of, of microbes on us. And then with some uh, individual uh, variations based on gender and again, how often you wash and stuff like that. Right. So we're shedding this stuff all the time and it's in this room. And if we spent a lot of time together, then, then the microbes that are being shed from you and the microbes that are being shed from me will start to homogenize. Just like that, there's that weird line, that, that sort of open border right. between plants and soil. There's a little bit of an open border between our shedding microbial clouds. We're homogenized sort of at the, you know, imagine us as two right. Venn di diagrams. Right. And we're, our microbiome, our microbes that we're shedding, our skin microbes, are, are homogenized where they meet. And so it's a kind of cool thing because it suggests that you could even define a family by its homogenized microbiome because sure. there's, even though they're all humans, they've got specific, right. you know, characteristics. And, uh, and so the, it, and the, just as there's a family that can be defined by its homogenized microbiome, so to um, a home space. Right. You know, it, you, when you go into a home space, do you ever feel like somebody else, it's someone else's space? Mm -hmm. But then in a matter of days, yeah. that's gone and it's yours. Your, your skin microbiota, your family microbiomes, uh, the, these um, uh, shedding clouds of microbes actually colonize the space. They mm -hmm. fill up the space. They're floating around. They're floating to the ground. You walk through them. They float up again. Um, in as little as two days, uh, a house can become your home just by this colonization of the skin microbes shared by your family. So it's a kind of beautiful yeah. thing. And I, you know, I'll tell you something that happens, not in the book, but I was in Denver um, and I was taking the, so this happened recently, and I was taking that bus that goes from 
um, from downtown Denver to the train station. And I sat and I was sitting in the bus and a fellow sat next to me, very down and out, rather aromatic, kind of homeless guy. And he hit me up for some change and I gave him a couple of bucks and he turned to hug me. And at first I was like, ugh. But then everything I had learned about our similarity, that we're more similar than dissimilar and from a microbial point of view, um, it just took over. And so I hugged this guy back in the subway, every, I mean in the bus, everyone else in the bus was going, ugh. But it was a kind of wonderful thing because I, I was freed from this paranoia that we're different yeah. somehow. And I, I kind of think that, that studying microbiology just made me a little more human. Yeah. You know? It was a wonderful realization. Wow, wow. So there's one other thing that you talked a lot about in the book, um, which is biofilm. <clears throat> and how biofilms are, you know, the, the nature of, you know, the microbes is what they do. We also know that biofilms inside of our intestinal tract, they're like little protective sealing, you know, havens where the bugs can stay and grow and proliferate and do their thing without worrying about being harmed by other bacteria, right? They're little safe colonies where they can yeah. grow. Good guys do it, bad guys do it, they all do it. And I was really fascinated by this whole idea of biofilm. I was also fascinated by an Ayurvedic herb called neem, and I've recently written about it. Because it's, neem is called the village pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how could one or be that. the village pharmacy? Yeah. But it was, and it, yeah. that's what they called it. And I was always like struggling to find the research on what made this herb so incredible. Um, and it had to work at some very, very deep level. So I was just, I, I, and, I, and the research just wasn't available. But recently I was able to, you know, search just the right way, <clears throat> came up just with the right understanding and I found all the science that showed that Neem broke up these biofilms. Really? That yeah. is interesting. Yeah. That is really so, um, interesting. So from my perspective, I'm curious your take on this. My perspective was, okay, you got these good guys in pockets, these bad guys in pockets, and it's like sort of like, you know, it's sort of like nationalism. No, but no free trade. Everybody's mm -hmm. like in their little place doing their own thing. But the gut immunity is globalism, free trade. Everybody can do their thing. And the more we have of that, the more your diversity can be experienced and, 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 and can be used right. by your body and therefore the gut immunity can kick in and get rid of these little pockets of bad guys that irritate, creates open spaces in your gut and let those pathogens in, things like that. So I'm curious your take. So I've been super fascinated and if now that I'm, as I'm digging into more herbs that actually break up biofilm, there are a handful of herbs like um, triphala and amalaki, different herbs that actually really are classically gut herbs and now I find out what they're actually doing is ripping huh, away in a kind and gentle way because neem is like the queen of the skin, they call it. So it mm -hmm. heals the skin while it takes away the biofilm. So I'm curious, tell us a little bit more. I know you wrote a lot about biofilm. Uh, tell us what, what you know, your take on biofilm and what does that mean? So a biofilm, remember when we did the little plague Say, bacteria sharing? Yeah. All right, so then if the bacteria... I'm not shaking your hand anymore after a <laughs> hug, so yeah, just, okay. just to let you know. I'm, you know. <laughs> We're, it, we're the same at yeah, the end right. of the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, too, which yeah. is lovely. Yeah. You know, it's very reassuring in a world full of yeah. alienation. Um, but the, so the biofilm, what they seem to do is um, they, so one bacterium can't do very much, but you get enough in a, um, what's called a quorum, just right. like a quorum in the PTA, where you need a certain amount of votes for something to happen. Same thing goes with the, these organisms, this bacteria. Um, you need a certain a certain number, a certain population number it has to reach a certain population number for anything to happen. These are plural organisms, right. but once they reach a certain population number, they start turning on these genes, and one of those genes, uh, or maybe numerous genes, um, to, uh, have, um, uh, uh, cue them to create a biofilm, which is like this sticky, proteiny stuff that is really, really durable. It's like, it's a, it's a, a miracle of nature in a way, because uh, biofilms are persistent. Plaque on your teeth is a biofilm. Um, tough stuff. It's yeah. very, you know, you need a pick to get rid of it. Yeah. It's really, really tough stuff. Um, so in the, um, and some of the, the people who really study biofilms um, frequently, so let me back up, biofilms are a real problem in hospitals biofilms will become their persistent colonies 
And if there are colonies with the, that either are all pathogenic or have pathogenic um, players, because the biofilm doesn't have to be just one species, they can be multiple species. Um, uh, these biofilms will grow on like um, surgical implements and they're very hard or you know IVs and stuff like that wow. they're very hard to dislodge um, and they're a real problem right they can cause a lot of infections so there's a huge amount of work being done um, by a number of researchers to try to figure out how to bust biofilms mm -hmm. um, and the what and I don't know if neem um, has any of the components that these researchers are looking at, it may, but they're trying to find a way to interrupt the communication system, which is the, which is a chemical, the, the bacteria, um, they, they um, emit chemicals which attract other bacteria to them. It's like how they communicate. So bacteria A community you know, is emitting chemicals to bacteria B, they find each other, and then they grow from biofilms from there. So wow. the idea is if you can cut off that right. chemical um, communication, they can't form a biofilm. It's I like see. you take away their voice and they cannot um, protest. I mean, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't want to, no, but you know what I mean? Great. They, can't, I totally get it. they yeah. can't come together <clears throat> if they don't know. Yeah. That they're the, that you know that that other bacteria and it's are there to not have them, right? Well, it depends. Right. You know, I, I mean, mean you're probably to say purpose, good right? or bad in nature, <clears throat> yeah. that's the quickest way to make a fool of yourself, from my experience, yeah. because yeah. nature's just <clears throat> no good, no bad, just like spectrum, depending on your point of view. Right. What's good for the goose be, but, is not necessarily good. But to for, be clear on that, like I mean, there might be a, a bug in me that's doing some good things, but that same bug in you could be harmful could be doing not so good things, right? Well, we have pathogens of our species, right. but one, like a Clostridium difficile, right? right. Which is, a ter I bet some of she your does. patients right. deal yeah. with that, and it's terrible, right. nasty bacterial right. infection. Um, but we all have C. diff uh, endospores in us right now. It's ubiquitous, it's in soil, they're everywhere. But we, it's, I think that what I, my takeaway from doing this research is that it's not so much about the particular bacterium. Right. It's not really so much about the species. It's about the population numbers. Which is about the environment. Which is about what gets fed. And do they have a place to live? Which is, so, deep, so it's like the host versus the, the germ, or the whole germ theory, yeah. host theory thing. It, exactly, right. it's right. all about like, we're the we're the ecology. C. diff can't take can't get a foothold unless there's space, meaning our symbionts, right. our fiber fermenters, have all been wiped out by antibiotics or a, colon, a colonoscopy or cholera or something. So there's spaces it needs a space it needs habitat, and, and uh, organisms will always fill a habitat. And if C. diff is there and can do it, it will, and it has to have food. It needs the right habitat and it needs food. And if it's got those two things, it'll <clears throat> proliferate. So Ayurveda for, for thousands of years, they actually talked about microbiology thousands of years ago. They called them krimi. Which, which in, is amazing. In, right? in, they talked about in, invisible bugs that live on forks and silverware and, can, and hygiene. It was written in 5,000 years ago. Yeah. They knew about this stuff, which yeah. blows my mind. But they also created a whole system of medicine that seems to be so so effective for supporting a healthy microbiome yeah. by supporting the environment, not clobbering with antibiotics or killing it, right. but using things like neem that would get rid of the biofilm, allow free trade, like, you know, a, a free immunity system, free immune system, things like that. But they also created a, a, a lifestyle, something called the sattvic lifestyle, a loving, giving, caring, kind, gentle, not warring kind of environment. Now, I found tons of science to show that when you are in an environment of of violence or next to a social disruptor or something, that it changes the microbiome in a negative way. Um, but I haven't found that much science to show because nobody does science on love and how the benefits of good things. Well, there is some stuff on stress. Right, on stress microbes. being so the negative could, side. Could, yes, the, yeah. But yeah. I'm wondering but on, the positive? on the positive side, if you run across anything that, because, I mean, because, because, you know, Ayurveda was like, you know, it seemed like when you really look carefully, their whole system of medicine was supporting something so subtle and, and almost like the more subtle it was, the more powerful it was. 
And that's how the microbiome works is on this really subtle level. You know, and I'm wondering if you've run across any science showing that, that yeah, lifestyle and kindness and love, we know it does oxytocin and this is your telomere. Well, yeah, I was going to suggest the, lo the cuddle chemical. You know? right. So epigenetics, where outside forces, um, outside stuff, experiences, influences can turn on inside genes. Um, right. The, they, there's, of course, we know that uh, you know you cuddle a baby, it turns on genes in the mom that that gives her these flow of of um, uh, um, positive, you know, I I can't even remember what the Oxytocin hormones are and like stuff. That, yeah. You know, so so mom does this, it feels good, makes her more loving to the baby, so it's actually. Um, supports it's, it has an evolutionary role, right? Makes right. mama more loving. Mom right. keeps that baby close. But there's um, so genes are turned on in mom by cuddling that baby. The epigenetics is the cuddle. The gene that gets turned on is this ox is the production the, are, of oxytocin. Are oxycont the microbes the conduit for that? Do we know? So there, there's a we have a lot of microbial genes in us. We have more microbial genes. Right then we have our own genes, because we're one species with a genome, whereas we've got a lot of different thousands of species of microbes, and they all have, each species has its, has its own genome. Smaller, but I don't even know if it's that much smaller, right. but they all have their right. own genome. So, you know, we're, we're supersized by our microbial populations right. to assume that there isn't epigenetic factors that turn on microbial genes, to me, is just, that's like, insane. I mean, they and must. We, and we do know that those microbial genes affect what we think. Right. The, from the gut-brain access, right? So if you create a, a loving experience, that will change the, the experience, the, the gut microbiology, right? Because they're being maybe changed by that epigenetic effect. If it changes your genes, why wouldn't it change the bugs' genes? We're all here. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I think thing. this is like this huge new right. area that the gut-brain access, <clears throat> uh, access is really extremely kind of curious and amazing. Yeah. Uh, but from what I've read so far, we're kind of in the, we're taking baby steps. So the, 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 how serotonin is made is one of those right. kind of things. So, yeah. you know, your mood is elevated by um, a adequate production of, of serotonin, but serotonin is made in your gut. Um, 80 percent of it. Well, the microbes that live on your colon that keep your colon walls that act as a prophylactic on your colon walls, they're by one of their byproducts, right. like they're right. pooping out, are these molecules that your cells need to make serotonin. You don't have adequate micro, uh, right. fiber fermenters in your gut. You're not making enough parts like the motors for your cells to, compo to compose serotonin and yeah. then you don't have enough serotonin. So they're so, clearly involved in this process. Well, it's interesting that people with depression often have gut um, right. problems as well. Right. So <clears throat> serotonin is just one pathway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there could be uh, you know, right. thousands of pathways so, at work. So we know clearly that there's this definite link between stress and the quality of the microbiome. What Ayurveda said, which I think is what, what very, grows in the micro, yeah, 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 is very prophetic, and it's what we write about here at LifeSpot.com is ancient wisdom and modern science, yeah. and the science is beginning to look at the idea that you know maybe a sattvic, loving, giving, kind lifestyle will epigenetically affect the gut right. bugs and therefore the mind and therefore you know the whole stable of everybody involved, yeah. us and them, yeah. you know. You know, it's true for. Uh, it, you see it in also in um, Chinese medicine, and you know in the Ayurvedic. There's a lot of um, the science is is beginning is as another way of understanding these same things. Right. It's what's beautiful about it is about the science is that it, it's a way of understanding that is highly applicable. Applicable. So you can actually yeah. make drugs and you can do stuff that's um, that you can't necessarily do um, uh, in other uh, in you know with in any a 5,000 year old medicine yeah. but it can go even further because um, you know I at one point I was just trying to describe in this book my sense of awe about this membrane of unseen life that 
this unseen world that seems to be so impactful to the seen world that's everywhere. And I had this huge sense of awe. I was trying to, to capture it in language. And my daughter said to me, she goes, Mom, I think you're just trying to find a scientific explanation for your spiritual feelings. And I had to laugh because she was kind of right. At the end of the day, um, it's not like, you know, it makes more sense that God would not be one big entity, but actually billions and billions of tiny ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, I, and I think, and those billions of tiny ones have feelers. They're aware of everything, and they, trans, they transmit that awareness, global awareness, with each other. And that's how we survive, because we have heightened awareness, right? Colonies of cells grouped together, or small individual cells grouped together as colonies to create a larger surface area of awareness. So the more awareness, the better you survive, and they're the ones that are still here. We obviously, like you said, are supersized versions of those little bugs, therefore much more aware. We can just carry now a whole host of bugs and have this whole communication system alive and well. And this is where I take that, is do we, as we live a sattvic, living, loving, kind lifestyle, does that mean that our microbes will evolve in a different direction than the microbes that are enduring one stress after another stress after another stress? And was that the, 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 the vision of the ancient wisdom? Was that, hey guys, you know, the violence and the, all the aggression that we have, that we seem to be doing more of these days, is actually not really good for the species Obviously, we kill each other, and that would be bad. But the loving and kind giving would make change the microbiology to evolve in a way where we actually seek peace and love and kindness and sharing. And I know the microbes started the whole war, and they started fighting, and they started love, and they did all of it together. So I don't know if we're ever going to get out of that. But you know, it just opens the door for so much, um, just food for thought. Yeah, it and does. it's so exciting. And, and uh, but I think what you said in the beginning is like. It's logical. It's like what you see at the, the, at the, you know, the level of nature we see every day really is happening inside at the microbiological level. So we can always, that's what I love about Ayurveda. You can always check yourself if it's a Vedic concept by saying, does it exist in nature? Can you reproduce it in nature? Is it real? And I think a similar logic can be used when you start thinking about you know, the microbiome. And then, of course, you have to go and, and, and find the science to back it up. But, um, but it's uh, extremely exciting. I want to end if, ask you one more question that you then talk about in the very beginning of your book. And you say how, how the microbes actually created our atmosphere. Yeah. They created the air that we breathe. Yeah. So yeah. we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Describe to me how that happened, and I'll, then I'll, I'll let you go. Okay. Then, yeah. So planet Earth, 4.6 billion years. It was a pretty rough place to live, yeah. um, at least according to life the way we see it. So noxious gases, ammonia, methane, it was, you know, volcano eruptings, boiling seas. Um, the planet was more like, the atmosphere anyway, was more like Jupiter or something. And so it was, um, it was not the, the, the beautiful um, oxygenated world that we live in today. However, some critters evolved, single-celled organisms, the ancestors of the bacteria that we deal with every day today, and there is, we have an idea of where they might have started in volcanic sea vents, where sure. there was an energy source from the heat, and there was food from you know, sulfur and, all, and ammonia and all this stuff that was coming out of the planet's interior, and these little organisms managed to make food um, uh, from those sources. Well, one type of organism is uh, cyanobacteria, and it was maybe the first photosynthesizer. And what these little single-celled organisms did is they figured out how to do photosynthesis, how to capture um, carbon from CO2 with the help of sunlight and water, right? They, they would break that water molecule, use the hydrogen, and release oxygen into the atmosphere. So there wasn't a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere when the cyanobacteria started, but there was a lot of water and there was a lot of sunlight and there was a lot of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. 
So they proliferated. And then there was more of them and more of them. And they kept releasing all of these oxygen molecules into the atmosphere, creating what was essentially a holocaust for all of these organisms that evolved not to appreciate oh, wow. oxygen. So a lot of species died. And wow. a lot of others went into hiding. Like, They're still around. In our gut, even. We've got some in our gut. Wow. There's some in cow guts. There's some in all, like in Yellowstone's hot springs. There's some, right. you know, these extremophiles, these these critters that have, from the really ancient world, they're called archaea, and they're hiding in these places where oxygen doesn't um, doesn't meet them. Uh, but so the cyanobacteria, they oxygenated the atmosphere, and those organisms that could utilize oxygen were the ones that survived the day because nature selects, what natural selection is, sure. is whoever made it under the circumstances. It's not like who's the best or who or some ideal goal. It's just yeah. whoever made it. So organisms that could utilize oxygen were the ones that survived. Right. And that's what we descend from. We descend from an organism a little bacteria that eventually that we still have inside all of our cells. The mitochondrion is that descendant of that little oxygen respiring critter that um, that became engulfed but not consumed by another cell 1.5 million years ago. And what's more, you know, people sometimes when I do talks, they and I say. You know, bacteria and archaea, they, they created food. They are the original producers because they take inorganic stuff and make it, you know, nutrients and make them organic. And people go, well, what about plants? There's always someone who asks. And I say, well, I'm so glad you asked <laughs> because plants, um, what the, the part of plants that actually do photosynthesis is an ancient cyanobacteria. That's what a chloroplast is. A chloroplast, which conducts photosynthesis, is the descendant of a cyanobacteria that oxygenated the planet in the first place. And is still doing it today. Still doing it today. Wow. I know. Wow. It's so beautiful. Incredible. I, well, I just love you it. You took us from it. the <laughs> microcosm to the macrocosm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I really encourage everyone to pick up a copy of this book, Microbiota. It's an incredible read, really Thank fun. You. She tells her story throughout about when she went back to school on her journey, and it's quite fun, entertaining, and loaded with great information. So I encourage you all to pick up a copy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.